Yeah, and I have my original 35 millimeter Kill Bill trailer before it was split into two films. It, oh, that, man, the, I cut this teaser together myself. That's right, so yeah. awesome. <laughs> yeah, and it was, this was not on the uh, Gangs of New York print. Yeah, yeah. That was oh, so man. cool. And just so you'll know, uh, uh, this doesn't count as this time, just so you'll know. Uh, um, if you're going to be in Los Angeles, you probably won't be, but if you're going to be in Los Angeles in uh, um, uh, and Christmas, we're showing at the new Beverly Kill Bill, The Whole Bloody Affair on Christmas Day. I've been waiting all my life to see that version. Uh -huh. I saw True Romance there in 35 millimeter a couple months ago. My, I'm a big fan of 65 millimeter, and I love the way, what you capture with the actual Ben-Hur lenses. Oh, yeah. So I'm wondering, going back to Pulp Fiction or Reservoir Dogs, if you could have shot one scene in 65 with the Ben-Hur lenses to get that much of, of, of the film, mm -hmm. which scene would you want to get that much angle on? In Pulp Fiction? Yeah. Uh, gosh. Uh, do, 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 do. Oh, well, I guess it would be the Jack Rabbit Slim scene. <laughs> yeah, can you imagine them walking in there with that? Yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah. From the moment they entered Jack Rabbit Slams uh, through the dance contest would have been shot in 65 millimeter if I could have done that. That would have been amazing. Now, I'm a big fan of how you use soundtrack and how you use score. And I think you look at Pulp Fiction and Reservoir Dogs, heavy soundtrack films. Yeah, yeah. This is Ennio Marconi, one of the greatest composers of all time. Mm -hmm. Talk about balancing out using a score here more than actually using soundtracks like you, you've done in the past. Yeah, well, in you know, it, it's funny because. Um, me and the maestro had flirted with the last couple of movies about possibly working together. Um, uh, but I wasn't quite sure, frankly, that I wanted to not do it the way I had done it before because I really liked the way yeah. I've done it. And it, uh, 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 it wasn't that I didn't trust him, but I, 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 I've been doing it a certain way and I've liked doing it a certain way. And then when I uh, uh, got together with him, uh, I decided we would uh, we needed to explore this idea. So we got together in his apartment in Rome. I had the script translated into Italian, so he read it. His wife read it, and uh, so we talked about it. And one of the things he asked right off the bat, he goes, "So I'm kind of curious. Um, why are you interested in exploring this? Because this is not what you do. You take other people's soundtracks and you mix them together in your movies with the different emotions, the way you want them, for, mm -hmm. so they work for that moment, and that's it." And uh, you do a very good job with it, and people seem to like it. Hmm. So why would you want to change? Hmm. And I go, well, I'm not even 100% sure I want to change, but I want to explore it. But the reason I'm here, as opposed to earlier times, I've just had this little whisper in my ear that says, this movie should have a soundtrack that has never been heard before. This movie should have a soundtrack that belongs to it, that is its own yeah. type of personality. And that was why we uh, explored it together. And I think I made the, the right choice, in particularly on this movie. Red Apple Cigarettes, I've been watching your movies forever. Uh -huh. You go back to Reservoir Dogs, you look at Pulp Fiction when Bruce orders them at the bar, yeah, yeah, yeah. then you go to Kill Bill, she gets off the plane, you have the advertisement, mm -hmm. and then even Rodriguez have one in Planet Terror, yeah, yeah, which yeah, is yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah. Talk about where that started. How did you know that that was gonna be in every one of your movies? Well, I didn't know it was going to be in every one of my movies. It was just one of those things that kind of built up over time because uh, it's a, it's referenced in Reservoir Dogs. You don't see them. Right. And Harvey ask it. No, no, Harvey just asks you, goes, hey, you got a red apple? Yeah. You know, and you think he's going to, you know, Steve Buscemi's going to pull out a red <laughs> apple and he gives him a cigarette. You go, what the, what the F is that about? All right. um, uh, and then I got we got more elaborate with it. Now, as time went on, um, I got kind of a... Uh, like for instance, we even did a, like a red apple cigarette that was like a GI issue oh. that had the little worm with a, a combat helmet. Yeah. But I felt it was almost too yuck 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 <laughs> to actually cut to an insert of that. But I think by the time of Hateful Eight, I got over any embarrassment I yeah. had of. I think people have been w waiting for it, so I actually just let Bob let her rip. <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> Everything that's happened with the police thing and, and, and these possible boycotts. You know, what do you feel about that? Like spending so much time in a movie and then these boycott possibilities. And mm -hmm. do you have any regrets? With whatsoever about that yeah I don't really have um, well I don't really have any regrets about um, um, going to that rally mm. uh, because part of the thing about going to that rally was was standing with the families uh, they're the families of the victims of, uh, of, of some of what I consider crimes mm. and uh, and hearing their story and bearing witness to them so I have no regret about that and I have no regret about standing up about what I said um, and I guess I don't really have a regret because I actually think the police are overreacting to this. Uh, I uh, and I, I think they're demonizing me in what I said, and I have no control over that. Mm. You know, I, it is an overreaction on their on their part. They sh 
you know, you should be able to complain about police brutality without uh, it being that you despise cops. Right, so I'm a big fan of filmmaking. I even have my original 35 millimeter Kill Bill trailer with me, but I know Pulp Fiction was shot on 35 millimeter. This is being shot 65 Ultra Panavision. So I'm wondering, does that affect the performance at all? Like, do you, are you aware of more things in the frame when you're shooting on 65? Well, we knew that when we were in that room, everybody needed an activity. Huh. So, no matter where they were shooting, if we were in the room, we knew we were on, on camera. Wow. So, unless we were outside or in our spaces somewhere else, then we knew that when we were in that room, we had to do things. So, we had to make decisions about, I mean, me being... Major Warren, who did I want to be around or who did I not want to be around? Did I want to be by this heat source or did I want to be by that heat source? Huh. You know, so that was always that. But the squibs are so mind-blowing to watch how he pulls those off. How do those work? Are, are they attached to you? Who's exploding them? How do, how do those work on set? Um, they are attached to us. Uh, and there is a guy who's off to the side somewhere. They used to have wires that ran off of them. Hmm. But now, I guess they got like Bluetooth, Wi-Fi <laughs> squibs. So they are actually attuned to the, to the sound of the gunfire. So that when the bang goes, they go. And they're huge, some of them. Um, I mean, I, I've had blood fly by my head when I was... <laughs> 12 feet away, I mean, as far away as the general is from me at a certain point. I mean, that was blood flying across the room hmm. and hitting the camera, so it's kind of great. That's amazing, I'm yeah, like geeking out. It now, is, it's like I wish you had those when you were kids so your friends couldn't say, you miss me. <laughs> <laughs> is it true that you auditioned for Reservoir Dogs back in the day? And mm -hmm. can I ask what character and what scene you read for? Um, there's a, a cop that's telling Tim Roth this story about being in the bathroom with the dog and the, yeah. and the drug sniffing dog coming in and the other cops coming in the bathroom, the cop that tells him that story mm. and teaches him to be, be the undercover guy. Oh, that's awesome. And real quick before I let you go, what was the first scene you shot in Pulp Fiction? Do you remember the first day on set, the yeah, first the scene? Yeah, the diner scene. <gasps> with the wallet? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we shot that first. That's amazing. Yeah. You know, Pulp Fiction was such a classic film in regards to the character, and I'm wondering, that character of Jules, if he could be in this room with these men, what do you think he would have, I know time-wise it would never happen, what do you think he would have done in, in, uh, in minis? What do, you, what do you think he would have done? Oh, he would have done you know, pretty much what I did. He would have found a place to get his back against the wall so <laughs> that he could keep his eyes on everybody in that room, you know, and made a professional judgment about who was who. Yeah. And who needed to go and who needed to die in what order <laughs> in, level of, in terms of their level of danger. All right, so you spent a lot of the movie chain together, and I'm wondering, as actors, how the blocking worked. Because I'm a big fan of filmmaking, but obviously you're chained as characters who aren't used to that either. So how did the mm -hmm. blocking work for that? It's a really good question because we didn't ask ourselves that <laughs> until we started working it out in, in uh, rehearsal. And we realized very quickly that it was a hell of a lot more to it than we thought at first. And uh, we did have to choreograph it. We did have to learn to move together. And, and uh, Jennifer especially because, uh, you know, I was in the position of being able to theoretically do whatever I wanted and go wherever I wanted. And she had to, you know, be ready for it. But she didn't, she wasn't playing the kind of character that, that would bother much. Mm -hmm. So we had to learn to, we had to learn to dance. But the truth is, he's, he really is a great, like the best dance partner. And mm -hmm. he's a great, I mean, he was leading. And I just had to follow. And so it became, after a while, it became yeah. effortless. Mm. And um, it became a big part of our relationship. And there was a lot of humor to be had in that and fun to be had in that. And um, We got and to the point, I would say, where the hardest thing for us to do was to pretend like we couldn't eat without... Yeah. We had to figure that. We had yeah, to kind of like yeah, go against our instincts. That's what I'm saying. Because like, it was easy for us to do. Because we got so commonplace for yeah. us, yeah, it yeah. became yeah. It became the most natural thing. In fact, <laughs> there were days like during the weekend where I would feel the loss of Kurt. Like that just felt <laughs> odd not to be connected. And I'm a big fan. John Carpenter's a thing. It's one of the greatest movies in the history of movies. And I'm wondering, you look at someone like Carpenter, who's the classic director. You look at someone like Tarantino, who's also classic. Do you pull something from Carpenter? from that set that you still utilize today here? I don't, but I think, you know, Quentin, Quentin does. It's fair to say that Quentin does. Yeah. He screened the movie for all of us. The yeah. thing? Yes. Yeah. 
at his house. That was yeah. a portion of his his outlook on like this movie. Week one. Oh. Yeah, he wanted. He, he, he there was a. Well, look, Ennio Morricone is doing the music. Um, it, 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 it's something that he wanted us all to, you know, feel that paranoia and that, paranoia that, that, that group of people where you didn't know who was who and what was what. Stuck by weather in a room. Mm -hmm. and how do the squibs work without specifically saying where they are in the movie? Or, but are they attached to your bodies and like when they when they blow up? Like, how does that work? He uses four to ones. See, he uses full loads for the shots. A lot of guys don't like using full loads, and a lot of actors don't like using them because it's 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 it, the, 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 it throws it throws out much further, and it's very loud, mm -hmm. especially in a room. But the the squib itself, usually you you know you can you can take a squib load and it'll come out a certain way. He has a certain kind of blood in a pack <laughs> that's very thick and very I don't know substantially gooey, and he does what's called a four to one. You'll load up those packs four to one. Now that gives a pretty good kick. You can <laughs> ask Tim. Tim yes. Roth about the game. <laughs> he got he got Walt pretty good. You mentioned they, he screened the thing. What else did he screen to you? Uh, beyond the Titanic, <laughs> right? Wasn't that one of the? We yeah. You know, um, we, we I don't know. This is where I'm go go. No, not beyond read, the we, Titanic. Beyond the Poseidon Adventure. Like yeah. like some of them are like funny films yeah. from like different periods. But no, for this there's the is it the Tall T? Tall T. He gave us the tall tea and another western. Tea, yeah. I forget yeah. the other western. I mean, he gives them to you? Like, you watch them together? You he gives them that, Usually, he would have us over to his house to watch his film, yeah. or on set, he would, yeah. they created a movie theater for us to watch films. But um, the tall tea, he gave us each um, a DVD of. What you're alluding to or asking about is, is exactly, yeah. Do you get the opportunity to sit down with Quentin at his house with a screen and get the night? He loves that. Yeah. He, like, lo he, lo he lives for that. <laughs> so, yeah, that's what we do. We do and group trailers. together and you know, talk yeah. about movies and talk about performances and trailers and, yeah, anything else. Because that's, that's what makes the world worth living for in for Quentin Tarantino. And it's, it's absolutely intoxicating. And I love that Quentin shot 65 Ultra Panavision. And what's interesting to me is how much he gets in the frame, which is absolutely incredible. So I'm wondering... Can you talk about what you had to do? Were you always noticing what was in frame and camera? I I, I I knew that I knew that he was getting a lot of it. I mean, <laughs> I, I knew it was more than what I was probably used to. But you know, I'm not a, I'm not a cameraman. I'm, I'm not. That's not my 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 department. You know, I, I respect it enormously, but that thing to me is a machine. Hmm. It's it. this giant machine, and it's like, oh Christ. What is that thing? You know, it's in this room, and it's 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 doing what it's supposed to do. Mm. It's kind of intimidating, but at the same time, you can make friends with a machine. Yeah. And 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 Panavision is is the greatest machine <laughs> that I know of. I told uh, my daughter Laura when she first began, understand that machine is your best friend. It's not an enemy. Is pulling for you, mm. and the first ten years of my career, maybe ninety-five percent of the actresses and seventy percent of the actors were totally afraid, frightened, and intimidated by the camera. Huh. So they would, the closer you would get, the more they would freeze up. Well, it's about let's see what's in your heart, mm. and that will show it to you. And to put it in this, I mean, I knew every time I came on the stage. I'd immediately go over and sit in my chair, and I knew that once I was in that chair, I could be being filmed all day long. So I just sat in a chair as the general the whole time because the lens, that lens, sees everything. Hmm. It's just too big. And Those I, are lenses from Ben Hur. I know, which is like freaking me out. I, yeah. I, I, I've been following Tarantino's yeah. career since I was a kid, and to be sitting here across from Mr. Blonde is like, a, it's so amazing to me. And I have to ask you, I've always wanted to ask you this question, how did the ear cutting scene actually work? Well, there was like, um, actually there was three different versions of it. I've seen all three on the Reservoir Dogs DVD. Like okay, I didn't know that they, uh, they show the other angles. There's an angle of you actually cutting it yeah, off. Yeah, I know, I remember, because I did it, but <laughs> I didn't know that they ever showed that to anybody. I didn't realize that it had actually been released. Yeah. Yeah, I sawed it off his head, there was one. But he, he actually, he did that on purpose because he knew that the censors would make him cut it. And he wanted to be able to give them something so he could keep the rest of the stuff that he, that he did in the movie. Oh, she showed the more violent version purposely. Yeah.
Exactly. That's amazing. These were smart. Yeah. And the Cowboys, one of the greatest movies of all time, you and John Wayne. And I'm wondering if your character from that movie and John Wayne's character from that movie were dropped into this film, into that setting. Fit perfectly. What would they do in there? He'd, he'd, he'd be Kurt Russell. It would be <laughs> courageous uh, to do that, to convince him to do that. But if he was going to be a bad guy, that would be the bad guy he would want to be. And uh, my character exists in a lot of Westerns. It's just that um, early on I had to play the fifth cowboy from the right hmm. for 30 years. And Miss Kazan told me when I went to California, the day I left, he took me to the airport, he put me on the plane. He said, nobody's going to know who you are until you're 65 years old but you're going to go out and play the fifth cowboy from the right for a long time. Wow. Do me one thing. You be the most goddamn interesting fifth cowboy from the right that anybody ever saw. <laughs> so yeah. uh, it's not scene stealing. It's just trying to stay alive in a movie. So you find honest behavior uh, taken from what's actually going around you on the set, run it through who you are, and let it out. And what he does is he does that for every character he writes. He expects you to bring what he hired you for. He sees something in you that he wants to share with other people because he saw it before they saw it. And that's his greatest gift. He's open to the human spirit. And when you sit with him before you're ever hired or anything else, he makes you bring that out because he does not like work that he doesn't believe is really happening in front of him. you believe the, the people that this guy's worked with? No, I'm like freaking out by John mean, Wayne. I mean, you know, look, I'm, I'm, I'm on the set one day shooting and I go to my, my dressing room for lunch and I turn on this channel I like to watch because it has old television shows and there's him on the big valley. You know, like trying to get this wagon off a of heath. He's, <laughs> he's all stuck in the mud. And I had a big valley where Barbara Stanwyck had to slap my face. <laughs> and she started way back here. <laughs> she almost knocked my teeth out. And then, and then the camera fog. There was a, you know, the old hair in the aperture. Right. So we have to do it again, again. Only this time, what I like. She used her left hand and clocked me on this <laughs> side of the face. And she said, you never saw it coming, did you? That is all. Guys, this has been an honor. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much. It's like, he shot 65 millimeter ultra pan of vision, you know, projecting in 70 millimeter. Biggest frame I've ever seen in my life. And I'm wondering if each of you could go through a scene from one of your previous films, hopefully Reservoir Dogs or Pulp mm, Fiction for yeah. you, um, or Django. But I, mean, I want to ask you about, like, what scene would have been interesting to shoot in 65 to have that much frame in one, in one shot? Oh, my God. Oh, you guys go. I have to think about that one. Oh, I can go. I haven't you can? done any. Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> you can. <laughs> you've done so many films. Yeah, but not a Tarantino film, you know. No, any movie you've ever been oh, in. Any movie? To have any 65, movie. yeah. I don't know, man. I don't know. Probably something from Mache uh, with Steven Soderbergh. Yes. There you you go. know, right at the yeah. tent with uh, yeah. Benicio Del Toro. Del Toro. That would have yeah. been beautiful to watch. Yeah. Someone call Soderbergh right now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I guess... Uh, uh, to, to use kind of Quentin's words and, and, and the, the feeling that shooting in, and our projecting in 70 millimeter shooting in 65, uh, he wanted to bring the audience kind of into the room yeah. to experience this. Yeah. Uh, I guess for me, a scene that I, I've done uh, from a Quentin Tarantino movie would be uh, torturing uh, Django. <laughs> like, you want to you wanna freak some people out? <laughs> Shoot that, you know. Almost castration scene Oof. on uh, oh, on 65 and project that on 70 I'd pay millimeter. To see it. That would have uh, you thought you winced beforehand. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I that would have been very very interesting to see on 70 millimeter. I think mine would be um, there's a scene which it, which he in which he's a split diopter in Reservoir Dogs between the cop that's been tortured and the yeah. and um, the character I'm playing laying on the floor. Yeah. And to see that, and he does that in this film, he uses yeah. the, the diopter in, in, in Hateful Eight a lot. To see that in that format yeah. would have been fascinating. Um, or your backseat scene with Kai Oh, the backseat. The backseat would have been something. Can you imagine that in 65? Yeah, yeah. oh, Actually, man. that's probably better. I'd, I'd go with that one. Yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. When you were laying there on that ground, on the ramp, yeah. how long were you actually laying there? Was it months or weeks? No, because we didn't, he didn't have the luxury of time back then. He didn't have the, the, the big the shoots. He, we, we shot that whole movie in about five and a half weeks. Wow. Yeah, yeah, but I was down on the on the ground for two, 
two of those weeks. What was the blood? Like it's this. It's the syrup that he used, but it it was a little extensive. A little. A little. Uh, I mean, well, you, you've got about nine or ten pints in you. I think there was more than ten pints <laughs> down there, and you know, because you want to see the ref you reflected in the pool as the pool's expanding. And yeah. yeah, I was pretty bloody. Did you do? Did you do five day weeks? Did you do six day weeks over that five? You know, I don't. I don't. I don't remember. remember. I probably did sixes yeah. because that was yeah. all we could. I mean, he only had yeah. a limited time. 